some of you, you are taking too much time trying to convince people to love you that do not matter. Some of you are taking way too much time tolerating and trying to get people engaged that don't matter, that don't care, that are never ever going to help you get into your destiny. I felt like saying to you this week, if somebody can walk away from your life, let them walk away. You shouldn't have to convince anybody to love you. If they can walk, let them go. If they leave you, it means they're not attached to your future. When people can walk away from you, let them walk. I don't want you to try to talk another person into staying with you, loving you, calling you, caring about you, coming to see you, staying attached to you. I mean, hang up the phone. When people can walk away from you, let them walk. I don't care how wonderful they are. I don't care how attracted you are to them. I don't care what they did for you 20 years ago. I don't care what the situation is. When people can walk away from you, let them walk. Because your destiny is not tied to the person who left. Your destiny is never tied to anybody that left. The Bible said that they came out from us, that it might be made manifest that they were not of us. For had they been of us, no doubt they would have continued with us. People leave you because they're not joined to you. And if they're not joined to you, you get super glue and you can't make them stay. Let them go. And you've got to know when people's part in your story is over so that you don't keep trying to raise the dead. you got to know when it's dead, David. When your boy is dead, wash your face and have another baby. you got to know when it's over. Look at somebody and say, nothing just happens. If they walked away, it's no accident. If they left, it's no accident. If you tried to make it work and it wouldn't work, it's no accident. Accept it as the will of God. Clap your hands, wash your face, do your dance, and keep going. No, okay. Oh, baby, 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 don't make me preach it. Let me tell you something. I, I got the gift of goodbye. I mean, I got the gift of goodbye. It's, it's a 10th spiritual gift. I believe in goodbye. It's not that I'm hateful. He said, I'm faithful, and I know whatever God needs for me to have, he'll give it to me. And if it takes too much sweat, I don't need it. Stop begging people to stay. Let them go. What if I told you that some of the rejection you have been facing in your life, it's because people are jealous of what's on your life? What if I told you that the rejection is simply an indication that you got favor on your life? God is getting ready to do something in your life. You just got to understand there's more to know. Come on, somebody. There's more to know. You got to make sure that when rejection hits you, you don't let it get in you. Because there's no escaping rejection. There's no escaping hearing the word no if you're going to actually live your life to do something bigger than yourself. You should get used to hearing no, but you shouldn't let no stop you. It could hit you, but don't let it get in you. I began to realize at the end of the day, as long as there's breath in my lungs, there's hope in our hearts, and giving up's not an option. You and I and we, no matter what your unique situation, your storm, your struggle, your trauma, your abuse, your wounds, your scars, no matter what they are, and I know we've all got them on some way, some way, somehow, some level, whatever they are, I promise you this, you are not a product of your past, you are not a product of your environment or your current unique situation, but you are always a product of how do we navigate gate through our storm but you know what else I had to realize I was allowing things that I couldn't control to control me you see growing up I blamed everything on my dad I blamed everything on him he was the reason that I skipped school he was the reason for my attitude he was the reason that I, I, I went to drugs he was the reason for my suicidal thoughts he was the reason for every destructive behavior like I blamed everything on him being ripped out of my life but you know what I had did I had walked into this trap I was allowing things that I couldn't control those situations that you didn't sign up for you didn't want to have to deal with it knocked it came in front of you and I allowed that thing that I had no say over I allowed that to control 
control me for so long. I was allowing things that I couldn't control to control me. And I had to realize I had to take control of what I can only control. I can't control what you think, what you say, or how you treat me. I can't always control the situations, the struggles, the adversities, the abuses, the hurts, the pains that others have caused me, but I can always re I can always control how I react, how I respond, and what I do. I had to take control of me, control what you can control. And truthfully, the first thing that I had to do, which was the most difficult thing that I had to do, I had to realize the anger, the rage, the hurt, the frustration, the pain that I had towards my dad, I had to let it go. And I was scared to let it go because I had had so much identity tied up in my wounds, but I had to learn I am more than my struggle, I am more than my wound, I have to let it go, letting it go and forgiving him didn't justify it, didn't make it right for him. But if a family could forgive me for taking the life of their daughter, how could I continue to understand this, that the anger, the frustration, the madness, the pain that I had towards my dad, it was only poisoning me. And I had to let some things go. And that's a challenge. Because for so long, that pain, that wound, it really became like a safety net for me. Because it was my go-to, it was my reason for all of my struggles. And if I let it go, then I had to begin to face some of my other hurts and my pains. And that's intimidating and it's scary. But the truth is, When we hold on to these things, it's not poisoning the people who did it to us. It's only holding you hostage. And so, I let it go. It didn't justify it. It doesn't make it okay. It doesn't mean that me and my dad became best of best of buddies. But it allowed me to begin to continue to pursue purpose. And we all got a purpose. Every one of you in this room, you were born to leave your fingerprints on history. Every one of you in this room were born to not just exist, but to experience life. But until you let go of some of the things that you've allowed to define you for so long, you know why? Sometimes we can't change and we can't overcome the suicidal thoughts, the self-injuring mentality, our anger, our rage, our wounds, because all you have been doing for so long, you're consumed by it. All you do is focus on it. It's everything about you and what you feed and what you focus on, what you feed grows and what you focus on magnifies. And I realized if I stopped being consumed about that, but found the courage to let it go and stop being self-absorbed but begin to walk even while I was still wounded, begin to move towards my dream. And I realized what I give away, I'm going to keep. And I started looking to my friends, my peers, my community of other people with storms and struggles. And I began to recognize what gave me real worth, real passion. What helped me really overcome is this, giving what you give away, you get to keep. When I started having empathy towards my friends, being of somebody that would listen, getting involved in other people's situations and helping them. Why does that help me? Because it took my eyes off my struggle and it put my eyes on beginning to help others. And when I helped others, it gave me real self-worth, real self-value. What you give away, you get a keep. You have to take the hand you've been dealt and make the most of it. Nothing that's happened to you has stopped your destiny. That person that did you wrong, they walked away. It may have been painful, but they didn't ruin your life. They don't have that much power. If they could stop God's plan, they would be bigger than God. Don't let one bad break, one injustice, one difficult season cause you to be sour. Have a chip on your shoulder. When we go through loss, things we don't understand, that victim mentality will always come knocking at the door. We have to make the choice. Are we going to live bitter, discouraged, thinking we're a victim of our circumstances? We're a victim of the loss, a victim of this unfair boss, a victim of this pandemic? Or are we going to believe that God is in control, that He's ordering our steps, that His plans for us are for good?
Instead of having a victim mentality, switch over to a victor mentality. That bad break is not how your story ends. The loss, the sickness, the injustice is not going to limit the rest of your life. God said in Isaiah, he will pay you back double for the unfair things that have happened. If you're going to see the double, you have to know that God is going to make it up to you. It may be unfair, but God is a just God. He saw what happened. He knows who hurt you, what you lost, what you're struggling with. He's not going to just bring you out. He's going to bring you out better. Get rid of that victim mentality. Quit dwelling on who hurt you, what you lost. You're not a victim. God always causes you to triumph. That bad break wasn't fair. You didn't like it, but what you can't see is it set you up for double. That boss that overlooked you, you didn't get the credit. You could feel like a victim. No, get ready. God's going to make it up to you. That set you up for promotion, increase, favor that you wouldn't have seen if that had not have happened. And here's the key. Nobody can make you be a victim. They can do things that are not fair. You can go through things you don't like, you don't understand, but none of that can force you to have a victim mentality. You have to give permission to become a victim. You have to make that choice. I'm at a disadvantage. This bad break has stopped my future. I'm asking you to not give permission. Are you going to get upset? Start thinking about how you're going to pay them back? Or are you going to kiss it goodbye? and keep running your race, enjoying your life. Those adversaries are getting you prepared for your destiny. Where you're going, there will be opposition, critics, people trying to pull you down. The good news is no weapon formed against you will prosper. They cannot stop you. The forces that are for you are greater than the forces that are against you. Stay on the high road and stay focused on what God has put in your heart. You don't have time to get distracted by all the negative chatter. What people think about you is none of your business. What they're saying shouldn't concern you. There'll always be somebody that doesn't like you. Kiss it goodbye and keep moving forward. Now there may be some relationships you need to kiss goodbye. Now, I'm not talking about your husband or your wife. Somebody just thought they got their word for 2019. Your time is too valuable to spend it with peace stealers. People that try to get you all riled up. Or with dream killers. People that tell you what you can't become. Or with compromisers. People that cause you to give in to temptation. Joel, I've had this friend a long time. If I don't hang out with them, they may get upset. What you're unwilling to walk away from is where you'll get stuck. If you don't kiss the wrong people goodbye, you'll never meet the right people. And if someone is not adding value to your life, making you better, pushing you towards your destiny, you need to make a change. And sometimes it's just a new season. The friends you had five years ago may not be the friends you need now. Everybody can't go where you're going. It doesn't mean they're not good people. You've just outgrown them. You're going at a faster pace. And if you continue hanging around them, it will limit your growth. You need to gradually spend less and less time with them. If someone is supposed to be in your life, you can't make them leave. And if someone leaves easily, they're not supposed to be there. Quit trying to talk people into staying. You don't have to convince anyone to love you, to call you, to come see you. You are a gift. You are a prize. You have something amazing to offer. If they don't want to be there, that's a sure sign they're not supposed to be there. God has people already ordained that you can't make leave. People that want to celebrate you. People that love spending time with you. If somebody wants to leave, let them leave. Your destiny is not tied to the people that walked away. Be respectful, but kiss the Orpahs goodbye.
What do I think would be a good New Year's resolution? When I do an assessment and look at my life, I think I have benefited the most from one thing that I do, and that is think strategic. Now, this is a, this is a military term. Strategic in the military means big picture. It means long term. Strategic in military terms is where you are going to end up. That's thinking strategic. And the opposite is tactical thinking. Tactical thinking, which again, in the military, means short-term thinking. It means, it means immediate action. It means what's happening right now. So, so there's a big difference. This is the differentiator for me is thinking long-term versus thinking short-term. And I believe that this thinking long-term, this thinking strategic is one of the most, if not the most important concepts a person can consider in order to improve themselves and improve their lives. I said, but I could use this form every day for the rest of my life by the way that I live my life because I would never let a circumstance or a situation define my life. Adversity is adversity. And the reason I love adversity is because you don't judge a person's character by where they stand when everything is all good. Everybody can stand up and do good when everything is all good. Everybody can smile when it's, when it's sunshine. Everybody can do right when everything is going right. Everybody can do that. But everybody can't face opposition, adversity, and challenges and say, I've been waiting on you to come. I'm going to embrace you, and I'm going to figure out a way to use you because you will never turn me into a different person. You will never make me a person that people don't recognize before the adversity. You ever seen a person that faced something and you don't even recognize? Like the thing I've learned about life, like everybody is in, in different businesses, you know, per se. But at the end of the day, we're all in the people's business. And what I mean by that is every day we have a chance to impact somebody's life, right? And I firmly believe with the things we're part of and the things we do, we all have to have a purpose that's a lot greater than ourselves. So when we hit things that we don't understand and that brings us a certain level of discomfort and that hurts us and we just can't pull the grips on it, when we have to encounter things like that, we have to step back and we have to figure out how can I use it? And a lot of times as people, like naturally people are selfish, right? And what I mean by that is they approach situations and they say, what can I extract from this situation and how can it benefit me? But the moment an individual shifts their perspective and shift their mentality and shift their attitude from me to we, that is the moment an individual becomes literally dangerous. Because now an individual is attached to purpose and mission. And when you have an individual that's attached to purpose and mission, it's not too many things that's going to stop. Them. You see, my football career ended, but my reason for why I lived my life, it never did. I just had a paralyzed white woman hand. My mentality wasn't paralyzed. My spirit wasn't paralyzed. My drive wasn't paralyzed. My dedication wasn't My commitment wasn't I was the same man. I just had an extra boost of energy for why I live my life. I wear this as a badge of honor. See, I believe the most powerful force in the world is to be consistent with the thoughts, ideas, concepts, and beliefs you hold to be true about yourself. And that is what identity is. Identity is the governor on every single area of your life. It literally sets the temperature for all of the conditions of your life. Shakespeare has this incredible quote that says, we know what we are, but not what we may be. And the who you may be is going to be dictated by your ability to alter your identity because you are going to always be consistent with what you believe you're worth and what you believe you deserve or what is your identity. Your identity, the best analogy I could give you, is like a thermostat sitting on the wall of your life. It sets the entire temperature for the conditions of your life in multiple areas. And so most people think their life is dictated by external circumstances. They spend their entire life trying to control what is outside of them. You've all heard the great saying that people in 12-step programs talk about, about learning to control the things they can and letting go of the things that they can't control. 
And the fact of the matter is you cannot always control the external factors that are impacting you in your life. The good news is it's the external things in your life that do not dictate the direction or the ultimate destination of your life. That is a fallacy. Listen to me when I tell you this. External circumstances do not dictate the ultimate destination of your life. It's an internal game. You and your faith, your God, are what will control the direction of your life, not the external things that are impacting you all the time. And this identity is that internal thermostat. It sets the temperature, just like a thermostat sitting on the wall, of the conditions of your entire life. Let me give an example of how the thermostat of our lives works. The best analogy I can give you is exactly how one works in the room I'm sitting in. It sets the temperature of the room. And so the external conditions don't impact the internal temperature of this room because that thermostat regulates the condition of the room. The most basic answer, I'm sorry it's so simple, but it's true, it's fear. You know, people making this complex process, this woman's told me that I don't understand why they don't do this, why I feel this way. I said, it's called fear. Everybody's afraid we're not enough. Everybody's afraid we're not rich enough, smart enough, young enough, quick enough, fast enough. It's human nature. But the secret is to do it anyway. I know that sounds so simplistic. My work when I'm working with somebody is showing them how to condition themselves, like building a muscle, so that you take action first automatically. Because if you don't do that, it's hard. You lose momentum. It's like, how do I get started? Where do I go? And I tell people, throw a rock, wherever it drops, start there. The next person walks by, I go, you're the first person after the rock. Do anything <laughs> to start the process of moving forward rather than let fear stop you. If somebody is, we were mentioning earlier, if somebody is really stressed out, they're not stressed out for no reason. It's because they're focusing on something that makes them feel stressed. They often, when they're focusing on it, it changes the body. You start to feel tight. You start to feel a certain way. And then they use language like, I don't know what to do. Why am I so overwhelmed? So three things control how you feel every moment. What you focus on, what you do with your body. If your shoulders are down, if you're breathing like, oh, it's not hard to figure out. You're not gonna be in a very resourceful state. If I take that same person and I change their body radically, I get them to talk at a different tempo, I get them to move their body differently. I've taught this for, what, 41 years. Three years ago at Harvard, they did a study on power postures where they showed that if you stand like this with your hands on your hips like Superman or Wonder Woman, or if you lean back like this, like the guy is obnoxious at the office and do this, right. it literally changes your testosterone by 25% within two minutes. It reduces cortisol, which you know is the stress hormone, by 30%, and you're 33% more likely to take an action. So if we change what we focus on, if we change the way we use our body, if we change our language patterns, will instantly feel different. Think it's how do people use their body when they're worried versus when they're excited? Yeah. If you learn to use your body first, use your focus first, you can literally change how you feel in moments and then you develop new habits where you start to feel good all the time and it isn't some phony fake pump up. It's literally the way you've conditioned your body. Just like being fit as an athlete, you wanna be emotionally fit. You know what you should do? Every time you get a chance to experience first class, you should do it because it plants a seed. It's like the next time you buy an airplane ticket, just ask for an upgrade. Pay a little extra money, fly first class. What it does is it conditions your mind. Once you get in first class and you see how wide the seats are, and you find you, you find out why they shut that curtain, see, because they shut that curtain because they can't let you see what's going on up there. They passing out hot nuts. Everybody get a washcloth. They got a menu. You get to decide what you want. All the drinks is free. Once you sit in first class one time, the next time you get on a plane, it's very difficult to walk past them seats. And then your mind starts thinking of ways to get back to first class. And guess what? That's what you start attracting to your life. And you start behaving and producing stuff to get you back into first class. That's how you move up. You just take, like, like buy you one really expensive outfit. Just see how it fits. That shit is high for a reason. Don't think they down there just putting prices on. Buy a really expensive pair of shoes, ladies. Buy a really expensive purse one time. It's going down there. Buy the real Louis Vuitton that ain't ever on sale. Louis Vuitton don't even have sales. Just get you one. When you carry it, it changes your life. It will then cause your mind to subconsciously produce thoughts to get another one. And next thing you know, you attract the thing you need to produce the outcome that you want. Life is all about the law of attraction. So Andrew Carnegie said something very simple. See, I can keep my mind focused on something for five minutes at a stretch. Five minutes. Can any of you do it? All the senators, 
they thought, what's the problem with five minutes? And he set up an experiment. They tried to keep their attention, they couldn't keep it for a few seconds. One moment here, one moment there, this is the fate of most human beings. So then he said, you should not be running United States. So, human ability, there's something called as chitta. There's a different... see, in English language, mind is mind. Largely, you're considering the memory part of your mind as mind. In the yogic system, there are four main aspects of the mind. I'll not go into the detail, but the memory part of the mind is of least importance. It's the chitta, which is connected with the consciousness, which is most important. If you find a shape for your chitta, that shape will manifest always because it's empowered by life-making material which you... which for lack of words we're using the word consciousness, that which is the basis of life. Once your mind is yoked to that, then what shape your mind takes? Mind is like a cloud, you can make it any shape. You can make it godlike, you can make it a devil out of it, you can make a pig out of it, you can make whatever out of it, you know? It's a nebulous thing. So what shape you give to your chitta? it will always manifest in the world because it's... it's empowered by life-making energy behind it. So that is the most important aspect of the mind, not the memory. Memory is important to handle the material aspects. First of all, you need to know them for your own life because you got to know that there are differences in intelligence. It's really important. If you go into a job and you're not smart enough for that job, you're going to have one bloody miserable time. And you're going to make life wretched for the people around you because you won't be able to handle the position. And as you climb hierarchies of competence, the demand on fluid intelligence increases. And so, unless you want to fail, you don't put yourself in over your head. Well, what's over your head? Well, that's a tricky thing to figure out. I mean, you have to figure that out with intelligence, you have to figure it out with conscientiousness, you have to figure it out with creativity, you have to figure it out with stress tolerance, with agreeableness, because you want to go into a cooperative environment and not a competitive one if you're agreeable, and with neuroticism, you want, probably want to keep the stress level of your job relatively low, because those are all places that you can break down. And Most people have at least one significant weakness in their intelligence personality makeup, and you've got to be careful not to place yourself in a position where that's going to be a fatal flaw. But what you really want to do, as far as I can tell, if you want to maximize your chances for both success and, and let's say, well-being, is you want to find a strata of occupation in which you would have an intelligence that would put you in the upper quartile. That's perfect. Then you're a big fish in a small pond. And you don't want to be the, you don't want to be the stupidest guy in the room. It's a bloody rough place to be. So, and you probably don't want to be the smartest guy in the room either, because what that probably means is you should be in a different room, right? You should look at a place where, if you're right at the top, it's, you've mastered it. It's time to go somewhere where you're a little lower so that you've got something to climb up for. So, and I can, if you're not hyper-conscientious, for example, you're probably not going to want a job that you have to work 70 hours a week at, because you're just not wired up that way. You'd rather have some leisure and, like, more power to you. If that's how you're wired up, there's nothing wrong with having some leisure. But if you're someone who can't stand sitting around doing nothing ever, then maybe you can go into a job that's going to require you to work 75 hours a week. And almost all jobs that are at the top of complex dominance hierarchies require very high intelligence and insane levels of conscientiousness, as well, generally speaking, as pretty damn high levels of stress tolerance. You know, because that can knock you out too, because there's going to be sh sharp fluctuations in your career, generally speaking, at the higher levels of a of a, of, a, of a structure, and you have to make very complicated decisions, often with very short time horizons. So you have to decide if that's what you want. So, okay, so how smart do you have to be to be different things in life? Well, if you have an IQ of 116 to 130, which is 85th percentile and above, so it's one person in eight up to one person in 130, I believe is 85, 90, 95, is it 95? I think it's 95 one person eight to one person in 20, then you can be a attorney, a research analyst, an editor, an advertising manager, a chemist, an engineer, an executive manager, etc. That's, that's the, now, that's not the high end for IQ, by the way. You know, that, it can go up. 
well, it can go up indefinitely, although there's fewer and fewer people as it goes up. So if you want to be the best at what you're doing, bar none, then having an IQ of above 145 is a necessity, and maybe you're pushing 160 in some situations. The moment you start getting feedback in your outer world with cool things happening, you're gonna pay attention to what you did to create that, and you're gonna do it again. And now you're gonna to begin to believe that you're more of a creator of your life than you are a victim of your life. Now let's just talk about being a victim of your life. If I approached you and I said, Brian, why the long face? And you said, oh my goodness, you know, I got a flat tire today, or that person didn't accept my offer, or whatever it was, or, you know, this person is bothering me. What you're really saying is something in your outer world is absolutely capturing all of your attention and it's causing you to think and feel a certain way. And yet how you think and feel creates your life. So the moment you give your power away to some person or something, the stronger the emotion you feel, the more you're going to pay attention to that person. And where you pla place your attention is where you place your energy. So it makes sense then that every time you say I am this way because of something out there, you're unconsciously signing up to be a victim to your life. And yet when you start taking time away from your life and retreating and changing how you think and feel, now this just isn't a panacea. That doesn't mean you, you do it and then you get up and you get on the freeway and you start cutting people off. You're doing it to change your brain and body to stay in that state of being. If you happen to maintain that modified state of mind and body for a good portion of your day, weird and unusual things are going to happen in your life. And when they start happening, you're going to rush the next day to sit down and do it again because you're going to begin to realize it works and you're going to want more of it, right? So 30 years of doing this, nobody changes until they change their energy. I know that. And when you change your energy, you change your life. And it is like magic. Getting people beyond their habituations, their hardwired attitudes, their emotional addictions, and causing them to step into the unknown, that void, the biological, the neurological, the chemical, the hormonal, the genetic death of the old self. They gotta be in that river of change and they gotta be in that place of uncertainty. The hardest part about change is not making the same choices you did the day before. And the moment you start making new choices, get ready. It's gonna feel uncomfortable. It's gonna feel unfamiliar. There's gonna be some uncertainty. You can't predict the next moment. You're in the unknown. So most people, they run back to the familiar and they say, oh, this feels better. No, <laughs> it, it feels familiar. It doesn't feel right, it feels familiar. And yet the person who crosses that river and says, what thoughts do I wanna fire and wire in my brain? What behaviors do I wanna demonstrate? The act of closing your eyes and rehearsing the behaviors you're gonna demonstrate in one day begins to install the neurological hardware in your brain to look like it already happened. You are priming your brain and those circuits in your brain to begin to think that way or to act that way. Who knows, you may just start acting like a healthy person. You may start thinking like a genius. Well, you install the circuits. There's no magic there. No idea works until you do the work. I mean, the reality is, Reading a book or going to a conference or having a great conversation where you get this golden information, that's all fantastic. But what makes mastery is execution on the ideas, not the ideas. And so no idea works unless you're willing to roll up your sleeves, do the practice, invest the time, put in the effort, do the work. I think we've all observed a lot of people who they love reading the books, they love showing up at the courses, they do all the online training and nothing ever changes. And they say, well, you know, I don't know why it doesn't change, why my life doesn't change, why my thinking doesn't change, why my performance doesn't change, why my relationships don't change. Well, it's because ideas don't work if you don't execute on them. So if you look at the great business builders, you look at any great performer, one thing that makes them great is their grit. One thing that makes them great is their hunger to practice. One thing that makes them great is they are willing to sacrifice. I mean, yes, they're passionate, but did you know the root of the word passion is suffering? You've gotta be willing to suffer for your vision. 
You've got to be willing to suffer to reach BIW, best in world. You've got to be willing to suffer the ridicule and laughter of your critics and your cynics to get to a place called world class. Double your income and impact, triple your investment in two areas, your personal development and your professional education. I'm going to repeat that again because it's such an important maxim. To double your income and impact, triple your investment in two areas, your personal development and your professional education. I had a conversation with, the other day with someone and he shared something fascinating. He said, in my culture, we have a principle to invest 10% in our personal development, 10% of their income in their personal education. And that's part of their culture where they live in the world. And I've never heard that before, and I thought that was fascinating. It's almost like tithing, but when it comes to personal development. And so, why do I suggest you invest in your personal development and your professional education? Well, investing in your personal development makes you more positive. It makes you more fearless. It makes you more confident. It makes you more self-aware. Investing in your personal development is all about getting to know your true nature, your potential. And when you connect with who you truly are, your potential and your inner genius and your creativity and your talents, of course that's going to make you exponentially more successful in the world. And then the second area to invest in dramatically is your professional education. You want to go to a conference every three months. You want to have a circle of mentors. You want to be in the rooms with the A players. Why? Because when you know more, you can achieve more. When you know more about your work and your craft and your skill than anyone else who has ever done it, you're going to be untouchable because you're going to see things that most people can't see. Everything that exists, everything within all creation, manifests through the harmonic vibration of light and sound. Everything that exists is light and sound. Everything that exists is, at its most basic form, simply pure energy. You have to persuade infinite beings, multidimensional infinity, which we call humans, to believe that they are ordinary men and women in the street with no friggin' power. This is my body, that's your body. This is my mind, that's your mind. There's no such thing as this is my life and that's your life. This is a living cosmos that everybody is free to capture as much as they want. If you capture a substantial amount of life, your very presence will become a significant life, otherwise you will become a mediocre life. This is the important thing. It's not the knowledge you gather in your head. It's not the muscle that you gather in your body. It's the life well to use another analogy. A dream, let us say we're dreaming that we're being attacked by a tiger in that condition. We're really afraid we're perspiring. We may even be rolling and screaming in our bed now. Is that dream? Real or illusion, the reality is we are having that dream. And energy is the stuff that drives the universe itself. All things are created from this energy. If you really get down to it and look at reality on a quantum level, it's all about different vibrational frequencies of light and sound, everything. And it's all connected because all is energy. What we experience in the reality that we live in is that everything is connected by energy and the energy permeates everything, much like the water permeates everything that exists within the ocean. You see, we're actually swimming in an ocean too, folks. It's an ocean of energy. And to do that, you have to spend centuries and centuries suppressing the knowledge and the information that would allow people to see the true genius that we all are. Instead of being infinite beings, the idea is to put us in these eggshells as I call it. Eggshells overwhelmingly made up of the four-letter word that controls the world, fear. So we shut out all that infinite levels of ourselves. Why are you laughing this is this mix? A lot of sense so you're out here and you're groping around and you're looking for your keys and you're looking and looking and your neighbor comes along. 
and says what happened. Wait, well, I dropped my keys. Oh, I'll help you look for him. And the two of us are now down here looking for our keys and looking. Finally, he says to me, excuse me, but where did you drop your keys? Well, I dropped it in the house, he said to me. Mean to tell me that you dropped your keys in the house and you're looking for them out here in the streetlight. Doesn't make any sense. And I said, well, it doesn't make any sense to grope around in the dark when there's light out here and we laugh and think how silly that is. But isn't that exactly what we do when we have a problem? We are quite literally moving through an ocean made of energy that permeates absolutely everything. And this is why everything is connected. This is why everything is one. Everything comes from a single source. And this is how we are connected. And it's how we are also completely separate. Now, when you really begin to get a grasp on this and you really begin to figure out what's going on here and you realize that the body is simply a biological computer that's downloading a specific frequency that you experience as yourself, you really begin to question why human consciousness is in such a disunited state. You begin to see how easy it would actually be to change reality. And you have to also begin to question how we got into this disunited state. We only have 3% of our DNA active. We're only experiencing a very, very small bandwidth of reality. And that most of our body shut down, our pineal gland is completely inoperative. All that knowledge, inspiration, wisdom, understanding, instinctive knowing, and we operate in a fraction of who we are. Only then can the few control the mass. And if people think, and I understand it, that a few people couldn't control this planet because there's too many people to control, well, they just have to look at what happens to herds of sheep every day all over the world. If those sheep expressed their uniqueness and didn't succumb to fear, if they fought for themselves, it would be impossible to control those sheep. But how is it done then? We find that we have actually out sheep the sheep. We have dispensed with the sheepdog. We police each other. The reality there are tigers somewhere the illusion is were. Identifying with it, we're thinking that that is me in this dream, and that tiger is about to eat me. But in actuality, the dream is real, we're real. But when we're misidentifying with that dream, thinking that that's happening to me now, then that's the illusion, that's the idea of yoga, or true spirituality to actually learn to live in harmony with one's own self. We have this physical body, we have the mind. And all of the thoughts and emotions that comes through the mind, but who are, who are we? And seeing through my eyes, I'm hearing, through my ears, I'm touching through my flesh, I'm tasting through my tongue, I'm thinking through my brain, and I'm loving through my heart. But who is that me that me is the essential consciousness that's giving life to every other aspect of our existence, our body, and our mind? When you really look at the entire human organism from an energetic perspective, it is something that is virtually inoperative. The higher senses are simply not functioning. The connection and the ability to be able to read and decode the energy field around us is virtually non-existent. And because of this, we are literally experiencing about 3% of reality. If you had a car and it was operating to 3% of its capability, if you had a computer that was functioning on 3% of its processor power, able to access 3% of the internet and use 3% of its graphics, in both cases, you would consider your machinery to be inoperative. And yet what we have is human consciousness driving a vehicle that is in exactly this same inoperative state. But we don't realize it's happening because we don't look at reality from the correct perspective. Consciousness is you, it's unique, but it's part and parcel of what is universal. And unless we understand that uniqueness of our own true consciousness, then we can't really appreciate the universal nature and how we're all actually connected. Everything is connected and everyone is connected and everything and everyone in this world is interdependent and Emerson said that the reason why there's so many problems in this world is because human beings are disconnected from their own true self. The senses, the mind, the intelligence 
requires to be in harmony with the heart and with the living force within the heart which we call the soul or the spirit and when we understand the sacredness the beauty the eternal nature of our own spirit then we can recognize it in creation and we can recognize it in others it makes it easier yeah but it doesn't cross the line where it becomes possible that line is crossed when those who concede their mind to someone else's norms then insist that everyone else does the same because that's when the human race becomes not only the sheep but the sheepdog that's the point when we police each other and when you've created this herd mentality my goodness me it's been around for a few thousand years now and you've got people to police each other what you do then is you break up the herd mentality into warring factions what you do is you create organizations and belief systems that can be played off against each other like religions political parties economic systems and all this stuff when we don't realize experience perceive the sacredness of our own true self then our perception is an illusion of the world but when we understand who we are and understand our harmony and relationship with the world around us and the people around us then we're actually seeing everything is truth we're seeing as a spiritual reality even in this world when you change the way you look at things the things you look at change albert einstein once observed that you have the most fundamental and major decision that you have to make in your life is this to live in a friendly or a hostile universe which isn't is it a universe that is filled with hostility and anger and people wanting to hate each other and people wanting to kill each other is that what you see because when you see the world that way that's exactly what you will create for yourself in your life and then you get people to fight and war with each other so now we're not only a herd mentality the herd mentality is at war with itself and while we're cussing each other and shouting each other and blaming each other a few are pulling the strings of all sides because if you are going to hold a position of global control you have to have conflict and chaos you try manipulating harmony you try manipulating people who have respect for another's right to be different someone with a different vision of possibility shows that the norms are not the only possible reality